behalf of the uh, Bartholomew family, I'd like to extend a, a warm welcome to all of you. We'd like to uh, open the service today by uh, asking John Bartholomew, uh, Florence Bartholomew's youngest son, to offer the opening prayer. And at that time, we would let, we will hear a musical uh, selection that was one of uh, uh, Florence's uh, favorite church hymns, and it's Love at Home. <clears throat> Our kind Heavenly Father, we children Here today are so very grateful at this time to be able to be together at this time so forth in our love. We love our mother and our father so deeply. And if we gather together at this time to pay tribute to our mother, who is now in their hands. We are so very grateful that we were chosen to be our children. We are so very proud of our mother. And we know that she is happy now. That all suffering and sorrow is is over, and we're grateful for that. We ask that the time that your spirit be here with us all, bless us, comfort us. We're grateful, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, for all friends and relatives who saw fit to come here today and show their love. We pray that we'll do all in our minds while there is time, Heavenly Father, to do the things that you would have us do so that the day will come when we can join our mother and be together for time and all eternity. And now we pray that your spirit will be with us through this day. Be upon all those that take part in this service. Because we know that our mother's spirit is here. And we want her to know that we are paying tribute to her. We want her to know of our great love. This we ask, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Margareta Nightingale Shaver Barthon. Born on January 24th, 1898. In Alexandria, Douglastown, Minnesota, to Ralph B. Shaver and Elizabeth Johnson. Florence raised her own brothers and sisters after the untimely, untimely death of her young mother. Of those brothers and sisters, she is survived by her brother Don Shaver of Minnetonka, Minnesota, and Jean Wetter of Minnetonka, Minnesota. She is preceded in death by her father, her brother, Bill, and John Shaver, and her sisters, Kelsey, Hazel, Isabel, and Margaret. Florence gave birth to eight of her own children and is survived by all of those children and her husband, Earl Willis Bartholomew. The following children survive their most beloved mother, Ralph Willis Bartholomew, Bloomington, Minnesota, Margaret Almeria Gelberg, Colorado Springs, Colorado, Betty Mae Losey, Minnetonka, Minnesota, Jean Eleanor Keller, Alexandria, Minnesota, Earl Raymond Bartholomew, Salt Lake City, Utah, Claire Irene Hammer, Brigham Young, Brigham City, Utah, Delicia June Driver, Denver, Colorado, John Arthur Bartholomew, Rockford, Minnesota. From these eight children, Florence had, has had the distinct privilege of having 39 grandchildren, 37 great grandchildren, and one great-great-grandchild, spanning five generations. The one great-great-grandchild comes from Margaret Gelbrook's oldest daughter, Sander K. Nellicott, now a grandmother herself. Sander K. was Florence and Earl's first grandchild. Florence passed through the veil and into the eternity, eternities December 29, 1980, at Bethany Home in Alexandria. We are privileged now to, to be able to uh, hear three tributes to their mother. Uh, the first tribute is by her daughter, Claire, uh, read by Sue Daniels. The second tribute is a letter written by Ralph Willis Barthon. read by K. Bartholomew. The third tribute was written by Earl Raymond Bartholomew. A Tribute to Mother by Claire Hammer, her daughter. Foxes can talk if you know how to listen. My mom said so. Owls have big eyes that sparkle and glisten. My mom said so. Bears can turn flip-flops and climb the trees and steal all the honey from the bees. My ma said so. No animal, bird, nor bee was afraid of her. She loved all the creatures. They were from God, you know. My ma said so. Squirrels she fed out of her hand from her kitchen door. Chipmunks would scurry to sit on her lap to eat the peanuts that she had placed in her apron pockets just for them. The wee little people, they live in the trees. My ma said so. Many a time this was the scene, when as children we were fighting on perhaps just too noisy for comfort. All of a sudden, Ma would exclaim, Hush, now just listen. Do you not hear them? They are making their call. So quietly and quickly away we would scamper down under the trees with an ear to a tree. We would stand hardly daring to breathe, just listening and waiting. It seemed like for hours. And Ma in the kitchen just watching and laughing, she had quieted us down without us thinking. Sing before breakfast, cry before night. My Ma said so. Red in the morning, sailors take warning. Red at night, sailors take delight. My Ma said so, always said so. Ma read us the Bible, and to good give our trust, God gave our trust. Our prayer she taught us as we knelt by our bed. 
Thanks should be given to my always did. My ma always did. Faith like a child had she, that whenever she knelt to talk to him, an answer she'd get, even if no was the reply. His praises and songs she did sing, Near my God to thee was her favorite hymn. My ma said so. Many a song passed her lovely lips, for it gladdens the heart and and the spirit it lifts. My ma said so. Her love for our dad we never did doubt. In her last years he was what she cared about. Ma was her name to our friends and neighbors alike. A special young missionary broke one tiny rule. Ma, he called her, not Sister Bartholomew. He still calls her that 32 years later because he's married to me and nothing could be greater. God sent us on earth to, to dwell here a while. He gave her to us to, have, to love us and to teach us of his earthly plan that we might be tested and tried and found worthy to stand before him once more and continue throughout all eternity with him and our family. This gospel is true. My ma said so. Thanks, ma. We all love you. Let me share these thoughts with you today. Dearest Mother, I hope that you can read this or that someone can read it to you so that you can understand how much I have loved you all my life and how when I think back as far as I can and remember all the times when I was very young, how you had time to play with us kids, heal our hurts, and understand us with kindness as we went into many stages of growing up. And oh, how I regret the heartache that I may have caused you. How I wish I could roll back the years and again sit on your lap and tell you about my hurts and troubles. How I wish I could bring back your health and happy times we had at home. How I wish I could be home. How I wish you could be home in your own house to enjoy your own bed and your own things. How I wish that you could sit on the Davenport and make all the rugs that you want to, but I guess it is a little late for that. But I wanted to tell you these things while there is still time. And finally, it is my wish that if I am good enough, I'll be able to spend eternity close to you when there will be no more sorrow or heartache, sickness or pain. God bless you and keep you, your loving son, Ralph. This is a tribute to my mother by Earl Raymond Bartholomew. The expressions of love and gratitude in this tribute are very much shared by all of my five sisters and my two brothers. As a child enters this world, one of the greatest, if not the single greatest gift a mother can bestow on that child is the gift of her love. Mother gave me her love. She made me feel wanted, loved, and needed. This alone can be a prominent factor in the decisions made the rest of our lives. It has been prominent in my life and judging from the fine lives of my brothers and sisters, they too felt that love in each of their own lives. Mother exhibited great love in the many sacrifices she made personally throughout her life. She went, she went without many, many things, and I'm certain that, she even that, that it even included proper food so that the children could be kept a bit more comfortable and well cared for. Besides her pure love for us, she exemplified the Savior's teachings concerning the Christian attributes of faith, hope, and charity faith in the future, this life, and the world to come, faith in her children, faith in her husband, faith in the Lord, which played a daily part in her life. Mother never did express at any time a gloomy outlook. A sense of depression was not in her life. She lived positively 
with a faith-promoting attitude, with a hope and sincere belief in a good outcome. I never saw my mother depressed, although she had many reasons to be so. She set an outstanding example for us in having great faith, hope, and just as the Savior, Jesus Christ, so taught us to have. Charity in her life went way beyond what most of us consider the second mile. Mother gave and gave all of her life. Now she will be a recipient of the eternal blessings the Lord promises those who live the law he set forth when he explained. Faith, hope, and charity as recorded in the scriptures. Of her it will be said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. Several of us born on the John O'Brien farm east of Alexandria. I recall in the far corners of my memory when my older brothers and sisters slid down the barn roof through the hole in the roof and onto the haystack below. I recall mother's care and concern as she continued to guard them against injury. I watched from some place below. The older ones were protecting me from all the fun. I recall my brother Ralph and my mother gently guiding the turtles away from our play area. My older brothers and sisters inherited the good humor that both mother and dad have always had as, as found in the, this brief story. One day the older children played a terrible trick on Ma. They opened the upstairs window above the front door and then one of our newer arrivals then set one of our newer arrivals on the front doorstep. After this, they went in and told Ma that she had fallen out of the upstairs window and landed below, sitting up and doing fine. Ma rushed, rushed around the back, back door around the house, and as she saw the little one sitting there and seeing the upstairs window open, she concluded this must be so. She fainted dead away on the lawn. Someone then commanded to get a bucket of water and throw on her to revive her. This was done and it was a traumatic and it was traumatic as I watched and I was far too young to know of the humor that was intended. Mother gave us great care, direction and taught us many things. I learned to appreciate reading as she read many times to us and often when we were huddled around the stove in the cold of winter. She had the art of telling stories and loved music. She sang for us a great deal, and that meant to me that there was that she was happy. I enjoyed the never-ending pans of biscuits that were hot and ready for us when we got home from school. I recall the hundreds of quarts of corn, tomatoes, beans, applesauce, pickles, and carrots that she put up each year so we could make it through the winter. I never remember, I remember her delight in her summer kitchen under the trees. I'll never regret a minute I spent helping her with the canning. I do regret not helping more. I recall seeing her take stiff and frozen coals clothes from the line before the day of the dryer in the cold weather. She spent hours hanging up clothes and taking them down. Many times we took, many things we took for granted. How happy it has made me to see her have a fine home and some conveniences in her later life. How very appreciative I am to of the many things each of my brothers and sisters have done for her to make her comfortable. This thing we call death is, is not to be feared. It is a beginning. Mother has gone through the veil and is now being instructed with further light and knowledge. Someday we shall be happy and eager to join her. Earl has requested that we close this tribute by playing Oh My Father, read by Delicia June Driver. This hymn represents Mom's religious convictions 
and a fulfillment of the promise for which she has lived. O my Father, thou that dwellest in the high and glorious place, when shall I regain thy presence and again behold thy face? In thy holy habitation did my spirit once reside? In my first primeval childhood was I nurtured by thy side? For a wise and glorious purpose thou hast placed me here on earth and withheld the recollection of my former sins of birth. Yet, oft times a secret something whispers your stranger here. And I felt that I had wandered in a more exalted spirit. I had learned to call thee Father through thy spirit from on high. But until a key of knowledge was restored, I knew not why. In the heavens, apparent single, no, the thought makes reason stare. Truth is reason, truth eternal, tells me I am not there. When I leave this frail existence, when I lay this mortal by, father, mother, May I meet you in your royal courts on high. Then at length, when I've completed all the things you sent me forth to do, with your mutual approbation, let me come and dwell with you. Including speakers, uh, Elder Dwayne Price from Salt Lake City and Brother Erickson from the Alexandria branch of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Before Brother Price uh, speaks, I'd like to explain a little bit why somebody would be here from Salt Lake City that's not a member of the family. Elder Price was a Mormon missionary here over 30 years ago. And for those of you who have never experienced Mormon missionaries in your home, it's going to be hard for you to realize the bond that can be created through the, the missionary. Sometimes this bond is, is thicker than blood itself. I have sensed that Brother Price is a, a close of a son as, as Earl and Florence's own son. And I appreciate him driving or flying all the way here from Salt Lake City. And on the behalf of the Bartholomew family, I would like to extend our appreciation and, and love for his concern. Okay. 
it's indeed an honor for me to be here today, and I appreciate Rick telling you why I'm here, because it might be easier for him to tell than, than for me to tell you why I'm here, but I think an awful lot of this family, as you can probably tell, and I think that I do feel, as a member, as, as he's indicated, they perhaps accept me as a member of their family. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our first meeting this wonderful family. I just returned from service in World War II and uh, had been called on a mission to come to Minnesota, and I'd been sent to Alexandria. We had a list of names of members of the church who had been in the area during the war years, and uh, we didn't know where they were now because many people moved a lot during that time for their work and other things. And so as we came to Alexandria, we had the name of the Earl Bartholomew family. And the day that we found them was really an interesting day, and it has a lot to do with Sister Bartholomew. We had inquired in town where they lived, and we finally got the instructions there out on East Lincoln. And we walked out there, and as we came upon the, the home, I was sitting back in the trees, the old home that many of you may remember. And as we got in, Jean was home that day with her mother helping her. And uh, I guess Jean ran to her mother and, and uh, said there were somebody coming, and her mother looked out and said, oh, it's the missionary. She could see, could see us up the road quite a ways, and uh, we were met with a real warm welcome at that time, and that welcome was never stopped. Let me tell you some of the observations that I have about the family, and of course you recognize that these observations are some 33 years old, uh, by and large, because I haven't seen uh, Sister Bartholomew or Brother Bartholomew since I left here at that time. I have seen some of the children periodically off and on as I've traveled about and come across them, but I hadn't seen the parents for that long time. But I found this, that first of all, has been expressed by these beautiful tributes by these family members, that there was love in the home. There was great love for each other. Uh, love between the parents, among the children, back and forth among all. The thing I also remember was the fact that they didn't have very much of the world to think. But I was so impressed by the love and the, the sharing that they had for each other that I was drawn very closely to this family. And we developed a strong bond. But I think that the thing that was most impressive to me was the great faith, the great devotion that Sister Bartholomew experienced. They hadn't belonged to the Mormon Church for too long, not too many years. And because of their somewhat isolated condition from the body of the Church and no missionaries during the war years, I'm sure that there was a, a considerable lack of, of knowledge of the specific uh, doctrines of the church itself. But she had a testimony that had come to her by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, and she knew it was true. And she expressed this testimony in the way that she lived, the way she acted, and as these beautiful tributes pointed out uh, throughout her whole life. I don't ever remember seeing her unhappy, as, as uh, was indicated also. Even in the saddest of times, when the hours were the darkest, she always had a cheery smile, and she was, would never let you know that things were going wrong. And we talked about some very uh, serious things while we were here at that time. But she had a cheery attitude, and I so appreciated that. I appreciated the fact that we would come, and I suspect sometimes that we imposed on the family, and I, I'm sorry for that if we did, but there was never a time that the table was not set, that we were not welcome to eat and to share everything they had. And there are occasions that I feel that because of maybe lack of funds that they might have purchased things that they would not normally have purchased to make sure that we had 
a little bit nicer than what they normally had in there. Always plenty to eat, but it wasn't always the things that maybe they would like to have had. And so I'm grateful for this, and it bound me to them in this way. I have a poem that I'd like to read, and I think it typifies the the uh, love that was shown in this family. This is a poem that many of you will, you will recognize. If I can get the right one, I guess I... This is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and I've always been very impressed with this because it's, it makes me think of love as I think it ought to be. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and the breadth and the height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight. For the ends of being an ideal grace, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with a passion put to use in my old grief and with my childhood faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with breath, smiles, tears all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Sister Bartholomew, I think, exemplified love in all its dimensions. And I think that, Brother Earl, that now that you, she's gone from you and uh, in this life, but I think that you must feel this love that she had for you also. I think that she's there. I think that she's aware of what's going on today. And I think she's aware of the, of the circumstances of this family being together. I'm certain that she has hopes for an eternal reunion with you and with these children. And uh, we've just recently celebrated the world's celebration of the birth of the Savior. Great event. This tremendous event that takes place, that took place some 2,000 years ago. But really, the birth is only one of the great miracles that took place. I think perhaps the greatest miracle of all time was not the birth, but the resurrection of the Savior of the world. That being the part where the body is reunited with the Spirit and live, we live forever in a resurrected state. One wonders sometimes Perhaps what happens, where is she now? If you'll remember the, when the Savior was on the cross before he died, he told the thief, asked him to take him down. He said that today wilt thou be with me in paradise. There is a state between the death and resurrection. And I would like to uh, read just a, a short Now concerning the state of the soul between the death and the resurrection, behold, it had been made known unto me by an angel that the spirits of all men, as soon as they are departed from this mortal life, yea, the spirits of all men, whether they be good or evil, are taken home to that God who gave them life. And then shall it come to pass that the spirits of those who are righteous and receive, are received in the state of happiness, which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace, for they shall rest from all their labor, troubles, from all care and from all sorrow. This is where Sister Bartholomew is today. She's in that state of paradise. She's in that place where she's in a state of rest and peace and contentment. She knows what's going on here, and all of her ills and her pain is taken from her. Her mind is clear. She's, been, she's able to see us and see things as they are clearly. We have a great responsibility ourselves. The plan is that we can be together as family. 
this is the great plan of life, that we may be joined together as families, that husbands and wives may be, be together and their children to be with them. Brother Bartholomew, you have this opportunity. You can plan for the eternities. It takes some effort on your part, as it does on all of our parts. But you may do this. You have the seeds of this in yourself, and you have sons and daughters who are who can teach you further as to what you must do to be able to prepare for this great blessing of being reunited with your dear wife again. Then comes the resurrection at some future date, and at that time each of us will be assigned to the place that we have earned by our faithfulness, our devotion here to the commandments here on the earth. There are going to be many sacrifices that come. I'm sure there are going to be some lonely days for the Bartholomew, and there are going to be some lonely days for the rest of the family. But I feel that the lonely ones are going to be primarily for you because each of the others have their husbands and their wives and their children and their things to go to, and you don't have that now. President Harold B. Lee, the prophet or the former prophet of the church, made a statement that when we make sacrifices, then we are in, li in line to have blessings bestowed upon us. And I believe this. I believe that when we make sacrifice, the blessings do come to us. But I think that we need to make an effort to make the sacrifice. You children are going to have to sacrifice some. You're going to have to put yourself out a little bit to help your, your dad. And I know you do this. You want to do it. And you do it all the time. It's just uh, Ralph or uh, Earl and uh, Claire were here, uh, spent some time here a week or two ago, and we're unable to come back now. But each of you and your families are here. It isn't easy to, to do these things. But when you have the love and the companionship, the devotion to family that each of you have, then this sacrifice is not really considered a sacrifice. It's considered a blessing because it develops the ties that bind. I'd like to think that each of us has the opportunity to influence others' lives. It's the way we live, the way we do things. There's a little quote that I think is, is very important to me, and uh, I'll turn to it here and, and read it to you because I think it's very impressive. Oh, that I were an angel, that I could have the wish of mine heart, that I could go forth and speak with the trump of God, with a voice to shake the earth, and cry repentance unto every people. Yea, I would declare unto every soul, as with the voice of thunder, repentance in the plan of redemption, that they should repent and come unto our God, that there might not be more sorrow upon all the face of the earth. There's a song written about this, and I wish I were capable of singing it. But I think of this many times. Oh, that I were an angel and could have the desires of my heart and teach people the beauties of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters and friends, family, family members, this is a critical time in our lives. We have great responsibilities to our own family, to each other. But peace does not exist on the earth today. There's difficulties throughout the world. Peace must come in each of our own hearts, in our own lives. This comes by learning what the Savior, what our Savior would have us do. Then not only learning, but doing. All of us are imperfect. It requires that we oftentimes change our ways, to change our way of life, to repent. This day is the time for men to prepare to meet their God. This time, day is the time for men to repent. We can't procrastinate this day. As we, as we look at the needs here, I'm reminded of a scripture from Matthew when the Savior said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If we have problems, we have concerns, let us call upon him and let him help to carry our burdens. I would like to take this opportunity again to express my deep love and concern for the Bartholomew family. His mother and father and these eight lovely children. And since I've had occasion to meet their spouses, had occasion to meet their children, I've been received just as if I were one of the family, and I appreciate that so much. Uh, I'll be going away again, and I hope it isn't 30 more years before I see the family members again. I hope we have that contact that can can carry us forth and we can keep this, this association alive. I would also suggest that you people here in Alexandria, you friends and neighbors, you uh, members of the church, that you also put forth an effort to make sure that Brother Bartholomew has the, the attention and the comforts and the, the spirit of peace that can come by being friends and being neighbors showing love and appreciation. I'm reminded of great states, great statesman of this country of a number of years ago, Bernard Baruch, and he had many political enemies. And he was criticized because he was doing good to these enemies, his political enemies. And some of his uh, consultants advised him that you ought to be trying to destroy them. They're trying to destroy you and his comment was, when I make them my friends, am I not destroying my enemies? Brothers and sisters, this gospel, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is true. It is by this means that man may attain not only salvation, where he may come forth in the first resurrection, but he may enjoy the blessings of the redemption that is a byproduct of the resurrection itself. All mankind will be resurrected from the dead, the good, the evil, black, the white, the poor, and the rich. Everyone will be resurrected. But those who enjoy the full blessings of the redemption of Jesus Christ, his great mission here, will be those who live the commandments, who follow his way. May I testify these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. all the children and witness the life cycle of Sister Bartholomew, spirits, birth, and separation from the body. We recall the words in Alma 40 and 11 in the Book of Mormon that the spirits of all men, as soon as they are departed from this mortal body, yea, the spirits of all men, whether they be good or evil, are taken home to that God who gave them life. We pray and share with her family the pleasant days of her spirit here and being mindful of the many promises and blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ as we live its teachings that her loved ones may continue to seek salvation and the ways to be recorded in the book of life now the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us that we are all literally brothers and sisters since we are all children of our Heavenly Father this is why we address one another as brothers and sisters the Savior has stated that he wants us to know the same joy that he knows, John 15 and 11. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might, be, might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. He has given us a set of principles, which, if we live them, will provide us with this kind of joy. He organized his church in order that we might participate in certain saving ordinances such as baptism and to cooperate one with another to achieve satisfying experiences growth we could not experience by ourselves and the Apostle Paul in Romans 14 7 and 8, 8 says that none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself for whether we live we live unto the Lord and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live thereof 
or die, we are the Lord's. Now the 13 Articles of Faith gives us a look at the principles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The first one regarding the Godhead. We believe in God, the Eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. And the second, we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgressions. And the third, we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. And the fourth, we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are, first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, third, baptism, by immersion for the remission of sins, and the fourth, the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the fifth, we believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy and by laying on of hands by those who are in authority to preach the gospel and, ad and administer in the ordinances thereof. In the sixth, we believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, namely apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evan evangelists, and so forth. In the seventh, we believe in the gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions, healings, interpretations of tongues, and so forth. In the eighth, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. In the ninth, we believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. In the tenth, we believe in the literal, literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes that Zion will be built upon this, the American continent, that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth may be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. In the eleventh, we, came to, we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience, and allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may obedience to the laws of twelve, we believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, magistrates, and obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. And the thirteenth, we believe in being honest, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, and in doing good to all men. Indeed, we may say that we follow the admonition of Paul. We believe all things, we hope all things, we have endured many things, and hope to be able to endure all things. If there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report, or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. Sister Florence Bartholomew accepted these teachings of Jesus Christ by his missionaries and became a convert to his church in July of 1929. Sister Bartholomew's family were among the first to be baptized and con converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Alexandria. We recall the meetings held at their place of residence and the baptism of their children on the east shore of Lake Victoria. I'm sure that's the lake. Where the missionaries had cleared out the brush and trees, and I noticed the traces of poison schumach and poison ivy, but no one was affected by it. The benches were used railroad ties laid out in rows. As the baptisms were in progress, people fishing in boats came in close for a better look at what was going on. They also were the recipients of criticism because of their accepting beliefs. The missionaries continued to work in Alexandria, and more people became aware of their teachings. And as a result of this family and others, we have the present chapel in the southeast part of Alexandria. I would like to read a few words from President George Albert Smith, one of the former presidents of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He states, the missionaries of the church go into all the world, not to criticize others, not to find fault, but to say unto them and our fathers, other children, keep all the good that you have received. Keep all the truths that you have learned, all that has come to you in your houses, your homes, and in your institutes of learning, under your many faculties of education. Keep it all. 
And then let us divide with you additional truths that have been revealed by our Heavenly Father in our day. Brigham Young, the former leader and president of the church, once stated, the gospel in its fullness is simply a code of laws, ordinances, gifts, and graces which are the powers of God unto salvation. The laws and ordinances which the Lord has revealed in these latter days are calculated to save all the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve who have not sinned against the Holy Ghost. Boyd K. Packer, an official in the presidency of the church, in a message of inspiration stated, We continually strive to share the gospel with others, but we cannot delude it to suit their taste. We did not set the standards. The Lord did. It is his church. The... Uh, Two more messages of inspiration by members of the church by Bruce R. McConkie states, While we yet dwelt in his presence, our exalted and eternal Father ordained the plan of salvation. This gospel plan offered to all God's children the privilege of mortal probation and the hope of eternal life. The late President David O. McKay stated, There is no cause to fear death. It is but an incident in life. It is as natural as birth. If men only would do his will, instead of looking hopelessly at the dark and gloomy tomb, they would turn their eyes heavenward and know that Christ is risen. One more expression of Hubert B. Brown. He says, Man's period of earth life is but one stage in the eternal progression journey of the soul. Birth and death do not mark the beginning nor the end of existence. May we all continue in search of salvation as we adjust to the changes of the times and have pleasant memories of Sister Bartholomew. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. On the behalf of uh, the Bartholomew family, I would like to extend uh, our appreciation again to uh, Brother Price and Brother Erickson for uh, taking time out of their lives to, to share their thoughts with us. At this time, I'd like to add my personal testimony. There's two things that uh, that my grandmother gave to me. One of them was life itself. Through her, I gained life, as many of you have. But through her, I gained my Mormon heritage, which to some of you may seem, it may seem a little, uh, well, not that important, but to me it is. Two years ago, I became active again in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I haven't been the same person since, and I won't be the same person again. I have a testimony of Jesus Christ. I have a testimony of our, His plan of salvation. I know where my grandmother is. If you just stop to think, and ponder in your mind the happiest moment that you can remember in her life the very happiest you won't even come close to her happiness right now I know that she's with her mother and father and her sisters and brothers I know she's here with us also I know she loves us all I thank her for my heritage in this church. And I humbly pray that all of you that are in her family will get your lives in order on her behalf 
so that you may be with her for time and eternity. It is our Heavenly Father's plan, and there's no two ways about it. I know it. Maybe some of you don't know it. But the truth has been restored here on earth. I know that. I know it with every fiber of my body. And I testify to her that I love her, and I love her for it. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. We are going to have a uh, closing hymn called The Holy City, which was Florence's, one of her favorite hymns. And at that time, we will ask Scott Barsani to give the benediction. And after Scott is through with the benediction, I'd ask that you rise and tell Paul Bears to death.